It is always good to be uh, together in worship, um, and I very seldom uh, am in this particular spot as we gather on the Lord's day. But, uh, but it was the Lord's will, uh, for we were unable to find uh, one of our number who uh, regularly comes and fills the pulpit. And uh, our pastor said that he would prefer that the elders uh, handle the service today. And so that is why I'm here. I did volunteer, um, so uh, I have prepared. So I, I pray that God will help me as I uh, do use the Word of God uh, that is like that two-edged sword that pierces uh, through our hard hearts and minds, uh, for we are resistant uh, to Him. But today, the, uh, the message, it, uh, I looked around and thought and prayed and thought and prayed and thought and prayed and then decided on an Old Testament passage uh, from the book of Joshua, uh, the man who was second to Moses, who then was his successor, uh, and who had gone into the land and said, yes, God will give us this land, and we should obey him. He is the man who met the captain of the host of heaven. The Lord Jesus himself, most believe. Uh, he is a man who was outstanding uh, in his life. And um, I had some things to say before he died, and a lot of similarity with what Moses said before he died, uh, we will see in Joshua. So the uh, chapter is chapter 24. Uh, we're going to read from 14 through 23, and then we'll focus on a few of the verses and uh, seek to understand more. Verse 14, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord, our God himself, who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, 
You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would use your word this day to help us to follow you. That in the things that I say, that your spirit would work in all of us, that we would become more and more like Jesus, our Savior. And we make this prayer in his name. Well, these, these verses begin and end uh, with the same statement. That is, throw away all other gods. For there is no God except for God himself, Jehovah, Yahweh, uh, the eternal uh, one. It is interesting that in this passage that the Lord is Yahweh, uh, the Tetragrammaton, uh, YHWH, uh, those four letters that the Jews uh, would not use. Uh, this is the name uh, that God gave to Moses uh, when he saw the bush uh, that was not consumed and yet it burned and continued to burn and uh, Moses was interested in what was going on there. And so he went. And this is where God, when Moses said, who should I say sent me? And God said, I am. I am. Because God is, everything else exists. Uh, the universe uh, Everything. So Joshua uses this name uh, in the whole passage. There are other names for God, uh, but none of those are used. Uh, he uses that, that name uh, that was given to Moses. And this is the God... Um, who worked in their lives and delivered them out of Egypt. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. How do we do that? Well, we often hear that we are to have reverence uh, for him, uh, that we are to see him as high and lifted up uh, in majesty, um, often we are told that uh, we are uh, like our fathers uh, when we were young, that we have uh, a, a, a loving but a, a fear because we know that we should be doing what they tell us to do and that there are consequences of not doing that. And uh, all of us, I'm sure, experience that as children uh, and not being obedient. Uh, and we were then punished uh, for our disobedience. But we had a loving uh, father and he cared for us. And God, of course, is our father and he cares for us. And yet it is with a measure of fear that we come into his presence. I've had lots of that uh, these last few days, uh, thinking about standing here this morning uh, because God holds us accountable for every word that we speak. And uh, we are more accountable when we are in the pulpit uh, than at any other time uh, in our lives. Uh, by the way, that's why 
uh, none of us normally <laughs> want to be here, uh, but, uh, but that is uh, neither here nor there, really. So fear the Lord and serve him. And serve him. What does that mean? What does it mean when Joshua says, serve him? It's an act. It is an act of the will, and it is an act to someone that service is due. When we look at the word, uh, serve him, um, it is an act of labor, of obedience, uh, to someone that you are subjected to. It's not something that you feel that you should do. It is something that you are obligated because of the one you serve. And the one we serve is the king. He is the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. He is the sovereign king of the universe. And so it's not an option. We don't decide whether we feel like it on a particular moment in our lives. You know, Job, when uh, he talks about fearing the Lord, he says that this is wisdom. Serving the Lord is wise. It is something that we... Um, greatly benefit from when we fear the Lord and we serve him. But it's not just that. Joshua adds with all faithfulness. With all faithfulness. You know, often uh, we uh, have moments of, of spirituality, I guess you would say, uh, where we have a feeling of closeness uh, to God. And in those moments, it's easier uh, for us uh, to serve him. Uh, but uh, the King James translates this as sincerity and truth. Uh, the faithfulness, sincerity and truth. Um, and uh, I don't speak Greek um, or Hebrew. And uh, quite a few of the uh, sources that I looked at the last few days uh, made a lot of the words, uh, but I'm not really up to that. But uh, I can say this, that the word um, is often uh, translated, the sincerity is perfect, perfectly, perfectly. Think about it. Um, I often ask my students, um, because we talk about the uh, central nervous system, your brain, uh, the cerebral hemispheres, uh, do they know the word perfect? And uh, often uh, they kind of laugh and they say, well, yeah. And then I ask them, well, have you seen it? Have you experienced that? And they think a moment, and then they laugh a little more, but it's a little different type of a laugh. And they go, well, no. And I say, then why do you know the word, and why do we use it? <laughs> and, um, and, of course, I use that opportunity to say that your mind is more than just a CPU, uh, one of these computers, which is what most textbooks describe the human mind as, uh, material goes in, information, and then commands come out. But it's more than that. Uh, the ability to consider such things as perfect, holy, eternal, uh, are beyond uh, the natural world. So uh, there's more to us uh, than just the physical. We have the spiritual as well. But uh, Joshua, I mean, this is just the very first verse, and we will not go into great depth in all the others, but this is the address now. You remember now, Joshua is going to die soon. He's going to die soon. And he wants to tell them 
what is on his heart. So he says, that we are to serve him perfectly. Perfectly. Well, and truly, in truth. We all remember that the word truth is common, but seldom, the word, excuse me, the word is common, but it's seldom a reality. This is why Pilate, when Jesus is before him, ask him, yeah, what is truth? What is truth? And of course, Jesus proclaims that he is the truth. That he is the truth. And so even though this is the Old Testament, the Old Testament is all about Jesus. And that's why we have it. Because it points to him. And what we're going to see is that they needed Jesus just as much as we need Jesus. And they were looking to him and the hope for their Messiah, just as we, too, have our hope in the very same Messiah. The um, throw away the other gods. Throw them away. You know, I I have to say that uh, most of us are resistant to throwing anything away. You know? Uh, (laughs) You know, I have to have a, a, a major... Uh, change in my thinking uh, to actually take things at home and throw them away. And, uh, but we find that there are problems uh, with uh, the Israelites, uh, those that were delivered from Egypt. And uh, we remember that uh, during the uh, uh, time in the wilderness, Uh, that quite a few things happened uh, that were not particularly good. Uh, And um, let's just briefly allude to those. There was rebellion against Moses and against God. Uh, There was a pursuit of uh, the gods of the land. Uh, There was uh, sexual immorality, uh, Balaam. Uh, There were many things that transpired uh, with the people. You know, uh, you remember that Joshua, uh, thinking that there was a war uh, when uh, Moses was up on Mount Sinai uh, receiving the Ten Commandments, but that's not what was happening down in the camp. What had happened was that they were tired of waiting for Moses And uh, this is a a classic. Uh, And so uh, Aaron got gold uh, that they had taken from the Egyptians or the Egyptians had given to them and had uh, made a golden calf. And they were saying that this was the God that brought them out of Egypt, a golden calf. Now, these are the individuals that were just delivered from the mightiest army known on planet Earth, the Egyptian army, that had been destroyed utterly. Uh, They had been fed uh, by the very hand of God and had received tremendous mercy. And so it is a, uh, it's a problem. It's a problem to have other gods And uh, it's, I mean, a calf? I mean, really? I mean, it could be gold. It doesn't matter what it's made out of. A golden calf? Uh, You know, Moses didn't think much of that. And neither did God. You know, remember, he ground it up and made them all drink it. Okay, but a bunch of them died. And uh, 
The other thing that we need to remember is that uh, most of those people did not cross the Jordan River. It was their children. There were a few who were there. But the people that Joshua is addressing now, most of these are children of those who rebelled. You know, <laughs> Jeroboam, Jeroboam, I'm, I mean, this is not an Old Testament, you know, go through the Old Testament, but Jeroboam uh, set up calves, golden calves, and Dan and Beersheba. Uh, if you've ever wondered about that, uh, it's because that was a major god of virility and strength and might and power uh, in the land. And so this continues. So as we read Joshua, we know what happens later. Okay, so when we talk about some of these verses, uh, they, uh, uh, Joshua knew. He knew. He knew what was going to happen. You know, Joshua goes uh, over and over all the things that God has done in these chapters in this area uh, towards the end of Joshua about what God did and why they should be grateful and they should follow him and serve him and fear him and love him and all those things that you would expect that are his due for all the things that God had done for them as a, as a people. And he calls on them and uh, he tells them uh, what they need to do. And they say, Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, God did all those things. That's true. Uh, mostly it was for our fathers, but, uh, but, you know, we believe them. And, you know, and a few of us that are here today were there and saw them. And so they say, yes, you know. Um, but he gives them an opportunity to not. You know, I mean, this is not what you normally do for your children. Uh, when you're uh, telling them that what you want them to do, you don't say, but if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. You know, I, I never heard that from my father. I mean, you know, this, <laughs> it was, you're going to do it or else. And, uh, and often I, I got the, uh, the else. Yeah, I, I got quite a few spankings, you know, up until the last year of my mother's life. Uh, you know, I'd talk to her and, and uh, every now and then there'd be a lull in the conversation and she'd say, son, I say, yes, mommy. She say, we didn't beat you enough. <laughs> and <laughs> you know what? And I would say the same thing. And that is, you're right. You're right. I needed more of it. You know, as we all do. Uh, praise God that he doesn't do that with us. He's, he's merciful and he's kind. Uh, but he's not going to pardon the guilty. That's for sure. But, <laughs> but, uh, but he does say... Um, you know, when he says, choose this day, um, but if you don't want to, then you pick. You pick. You pick who you will serve. And you know, our lives are like this, uh, and we all know it's true. Uh, we're going to serve someone. I mean, Martin Luther, a famous statement of his about man is a donkey, and either, uh, you know, he's going to be ridden by the Holy Spirit uh, in a wonderful relationship uh, or by the devil in a horrific type of relationship. Uh, we are, uh, we have that in us. It's, it's part of our nature. And so Joshua understands that. And he says, if you want to serve other gods, then go on and you do that. Again, this is not something that is a, I mean, this is not the, the norm. I mean, this is a huge thing, really, when he gives them the opportunity to choose poorly. Awful choice. Awful choice. I mean, we think about the uh, Amorites, you know, their God uh, was Molech, uh, Chemosh, uh, same type of God. Uh, this is the God that you remember um, was used uh, to sacrifice your children. You know, 
I mean, it was a, a big metal, kind of a, it was, a, by the way, a bull, a bull, represented as a bull, and it had a big furnace in it. And they would heat it up, and then they would get out the drummers and the flute players and the singers and whomever, and they would put their children onto the arms of Molech, and they would be burned to death. That's one of the gods. That's one of the gods that is mentioned. Can you imagine giving someone a choice to serve a god in which you take your own child and you burn them to death? Uh, not always willingly. Sometimes the children were taken. Um, the Sumerians, Ur of the Chaldees, you know, they had a lot of gods. Um, one of the uh, main things, as I read through these, and I can give you all of their names and, you know, what they were uh, being attributed to control, uh, but one of the main issues was a female goddess, a female goddess. And these goddesses that were in Samaria or in Egypt are in Canaan, uh, were always similar in that they were goddesses of uh, passion, uh, sexuality, uh, things that um, Balaam used against the children of Israel. And so the uh, Sumerians had Inanna, or Ishtar, and the Egyptians had Hathor, or Isis. Uh, these are both um, goddesses, and they are very uh, much uh, in the culture of these places. And later, of course, we know about Astra and Jezebel and all that. That comes later, though. This is before that. But it's the same song. It's the same song. It's the same over and over and over again. Uh, the gods of the land and the enticement of not just the men, but women too. So uh, Joshua gives them these choices. And they're all bad. In the light of day... No person would say, I'm going to take my child and burn them to death. You know? Although in America, we have people in the light of day who take their child and they sacrifice them in abortion. You know? There is no difference. There is no difference. Sacrifice of children has been going on forever after the fall. And so whether you put them into the arms of Molech or Chemosh, uh, or you go down to the clinic, death of your child is the end result. We look at the sexual issues of our society. A lot of similarities. A lot of similarities. A lot of similarities. But Joshua says this, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. We have the other choices, but we have made our choice. You know, choose this day. Choose this day. Choose this day. This is every day. This is every day when we wake up, we choose that day. What are we going to do with our lives that day? You know, God's mercies are new every morning. Every morning when we wake up, God is king and we're his child, you know. And so, um, I mean, Joshua does say this day, but every day is the day that the Lord has made. And as Christians, we should rejoice and be glad in that 
And we should choose. You know, we choose. He chose us first, and that's why we can choose him every morning when we get up. And when we have that kind of a, of a morning, we have a much better day. And we all know that that's true. But this is a national choosing. This is not something when you get out of bed and stumble to get your cup of coffee. Uh, this is for the rest of their lives. Okay. When you choose to not follow Yahweh, uh, then you're no longer an Israelite. And you are cut off from the people. And you are separate at that point. So, everybody says, oh, well, (laughs) I mean, of course we're going to choose the Lord. You know, we're going to choose the Lord. We're going to choose the Lord. But there's no, uh, how would you call it? Uh, There's no substance in what they're saying. And Joshua reads it, you know, because in ourselves we can do nothing. And this is the fact that we all have experienced once we've come to know Christ, that we are unable. Paul says that his weakness uh, is strength, though, because he understands that he can't do it. And it's God in him. Uh, that's working in him to bring those things that are good and lasting uh, in his life. And so the people, you know, they all say, yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. And then this is a, um, uh, an amazing statement uh, because he looks at, I mean, this is a huge, huge group of people now. And he goes, no, no. He goes, no, you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. Because you don't have the right understanding and the inner change. You know? And he says, why? He gives several reasons, but but the main ones are God is holy. That's the first one. God is holy. Remember what Peter said. He said, Lord... Please get out of my boat. Please get out of my boat. I'm a sinful man. And he saw the holiness of God in Jesus. And so, uh, Joshua, I mean, I can pretty much guarantee that the people were not expecting Joshua to say, after this huge acclamation of no, no, we're going to serve the Lord, that there was no expectation that their leader was going to say, you cannot and you will not. You cannot and you will not. Um, And apart from an inward change, neither can we. You know, the Bible is very clear about our condition apart from Jesus Christ. That we are sinful, that we turn to our own path, that we reject God, and we do what we want to do. One of the things about growing older is that we get better at it, you know? And Lewis uh, talks a lot about that and how people either become more like Jesus or they become more like an animal, a beast, you know. Um, in Isaiah chapter 42, there's a verse that we often uh, read, um, and here it is. I am the Lord, that is my name, and I will not give my glory To another are my praise to idols. Again, Yahweh, I am. So what is a fundamental problem is that the glory that is due to God and God alone is being given to others. And this has been going on 
the before, it's going on the day of Joshua addressing the people, and it goes on after he dies. And it continues until this day. It continues unto this day. The problem is inside. It's not outside. It's inside. And all of us have experienced this with a child, if we've had one. You don't really have to have one. You can experience with children without it. And that is you can make them conform. But you can tell that inside they are not conforming. You know, uh, they're... They're of the same opinion still, you know. Um, you know, our hearts, as Jeremiah said, are deceitfully wicked. You know, I mean, we need help. And there's no help other than the help from God himself. In Deuteronomy, uh, Moses has, The Lord your God will bring you into the land your fathers possessed, and you will take possession of it. He will cause you to prosper and multiply more than your fathers. The Lord Yahweh, your God, will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants, and you will love him with all your heart and all your soul that you may live. It sounds like Jesus and, you know, the great commandments, you know, because it is. <laughs> uh, Jesus used the Old Testament in all of his quotations. There was no New Testament when Jesus was there. And so when he spoke the words of God, he spoke those from the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. I mean, Moses knew that the heart was the issue that the outward sign of circumcision was insufficient. Joshua knows that outward conformity does not change inside your heart or your mind and your desire of what it is you want to be and what you want to do. It takes God. God alone can do these things. Ezekiel in 36 chapter he says, I will also sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to carefully observe my ordinances. This is the Old Testament. This is the Old Covenant. But it's the same as the New. The purpose of the law was not so that anybody could do it. It was to prove that you couldn't do it. You can't do it. You can't. And so you have to put your hope and your confidence and your faith in God. And that's the only place. Some are confused about that. They, they do think that somehow they're going to be able to do it. But I can promise on the authority of the word of God that you can not do it. You can't do it. Paul is a different sermon, but he has lots to say about that. Okay? You just can't do it. You can't do it. And by the way, why would you even try? Because the moment that you're concerned about it, you already have sinned. So you know you've already sinned, and if you've sinned one sin, then that's all it takes, and you're now cut off from the holy God that Joshua mentions, God, Yahweh, is a holy God. And so there's, we're not, and if you're not, then you cannot be in the presence of that which is. You know, uh, David, David, the man after God's own heart, uh, sinned. And he had several uh, sins. Um, 
and he's not a good example of Father's Day. Uh, he did not do a good job. He, he turned over his responsibilities to someone else uh, in his house uh, to care for his sons. Um, and overall, they did not turn out well. They did not turn out well. But David understood about God and about himself, too. You know, we're going to sing this, a uh, part of this, and this is what David has to say in Psalm 51. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving devotion, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me clean of my iniquity and cleanse me from my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. God. God is the one. He is the one who is required to serve, to follow, to obey, to love, and to have that faith in. I want to close with uh, the first big sermon. Uh, in the Christian church. Uh, we call it the uh, Day of Pentecost sermon uh, that Peter uh, addressed the people. And the people of Israel had become uh, distant uh, from God. And uh, everything had become external. And uh, Jesus, of course, addresses that over and over and over again when he talks to the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, uh, whomever it might be. And so when Peter is addressing the people, uh, there is no New Testament. And so Peter's address uses the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and he uses a passage from a uh, minor prophet, uh, Joel. And uh, Joel says this, he says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all the people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. So, this is what Joshua says at the end of his address. Again, throw away your foreign gods. That means you don't have them. They're gone. Okay? And then he says this, and yield your hearts to the Lord. It is inside, not outside. You have to have a change that only God can give. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And this is the same cry and the same hope, the same faith that we have today. And that is that God will change our hearts and that we can then seek him, love him, and serve him.